Hello again, one and all. It's me, Matt. Thanks so much for joining me today on the channel. Before we begin, I have to take a moment to acknowledge that there is ongoing conflict and war in the region that this particular vehicle is being utilized in. I want to make it clear that this video is focused purely on the military hardware, the engineering, and its context in how it's featured and the abilities that it has. My goal is always to remain neutral and objective when discussing military vehicles, and I have no intention of making political statements or offending anyone, and I'm not allowed to anyway with the way in which I operate with my social media policy in the Canadian Armed Forces. The name APC is what we're talking about today, and it's a fascinating piece of engineering, and this discussion today will be centered on its design, development, and capabilities rather than the ongoing conflicts involved with things like Palestine and the Gaza Strip. So today, we're diving into this world of Israeli armored warfare, specifically looking at one of the most heavily armored personnel carriers on the planet, the NAMA, or NAMA, I'm really not sure which way to say it. This vehicle isn't just an armored box on tracks, though, it's a fortress on wheels and an absolute beast in modern infantry transport. But to understand why Israel built such a well-protected APC, we have to go back in time and examine the battlefield challenges that led to its creation. Israel's approach to armored vehicles has always been driven by necessity. As a small nation surrounded by its own adversaries, every soldier's life is invaluable. Unlike larger countries that can sustain heavier casualties, Israel must ensure its troops can fight, survive, and return home for another battle. For decades, the backbone of the Israeli Defense Forces, or IDF, armored personnel transports were the American-made M113 APC with some modifications. While it is truly a great utility vehicle in the 1960s and 70s, it quickly became obsolete in the face of modern threats. Urban warfare, ambushes, and widespread use of RPGs and anti-tank missiles have exposed many of the M113's fatal flaws. It was a little more than a rolling aluminum box with barely enough armor to even stop small arms fire. By the 1980s, Israeli forces faced increasingly large amounts of casualties, especially in conflicts with Lebanon, and the IDF quickly realized that a new approach was needed, one that prioritized survivability over everything else. Instead of designing an APC from scratch, though, they took a unique approach, repurposing the outdated tank chassis into a heavily armored personnel carrier. The first attempts included the Nagmashon, based on the Centurion tank, and the Ashzerit, built on the Soviet-captured T-55 tanks. These vehicles offered significantly better protection than the M113, but they also had many limitations. Their rear engine design made troop dismounts awkward and unsafe in battle, and the space inside was still very cramped. The perfect solution, though, was really hiding in plain sight. The beautiful Makava main battle tank. Unlike most tanks, the Makava was designed with its engine in the front, creating a natural rear compartment that could be used to store ammunition or troops. The idea of converting older Makavas into APCs was first explored in the 1990s, but at the time, budget constraints prevented the project from moving forward. However, things changed in the early 2000s, and asymmetric warfare in Gaza and Lebanon became the growing threat. The IDF needed a modern, heavy-duty APC capable of transporting troops safely through RPG-infested streets and mine-laden battlefields. In 2005, the first prototype of what would become the NAMA, or Namara, or Lioness, was unveiled, based on the Makava Mark I chassis. While the idea, though, was very promising, Israel ultimately decided that using the newer Makava Mark IV as the foundation for the dedicated APC was a much smarter choice. And I would agree, why not just use a newer platform? Thus, in 2008, the NAMA was officially born. It wasn't just an upgraded version, though, of the previous heavy-duty APCs. It was purpose-built armored transport specifically for the infantry, designed from the ground up with the best protection the IDF could offer for its troops inside. Most APCs and infantry fighting vehicles are built from scratch, using different design philosophies than main battle tanks. But Israel had a very unique advantage. The Makava tank series was well tested, well designed, and worked very well for troops on the ground, and in essence was already a bit of a troop carrier. Now in 2005, Israel tested the first prototype of this APC. It was based on the Makava Mark I chassis, but early designs proved that the concept worked, but there were significant challenges. The older structure made mass production very costly, and Israel's defense industry had already moved on 
to the Makava Mark IV. So, in 2008, they unveiled the Namer and officially used the Mark IV's hull, and unlike its predecessor, this was specifically designed for mass production, featuring an upgraded engine, modular armor, and the latest in active protection systems. To turn a tank into an APC, Israel had to make several crucial modifications. The turret was obviously removed, significantly reducing weight. A reinforced ramp was added, allowing troops to exit quickly under cover. Extra armor was applied to maintain the same level of protection as the main battle tank. Seating was designed for up to 12 occupants, including crew and infantry. And the trophy active protection system was integrated for enhanced defense against anti-tank weapons, which as you probably all know, Trophy is one of the best APS systems in the world. The result, a vehicle just as armored as the Mark IV, Makava, but now capable of transporting an entire infantry squad into combat. The Namer is often described as the mobile bunker, and for good reason. While most armored personnel carriers prioritize mobility, the Namer takes a different approach. It prioritizes survivability above all else. But let's break down a little bit as to why this is the toughest combat transport in the world. It does have advanced composite armor, which is obviously classified, designed to resist kinetic and shape charge attacks from all angles. That's right, not just the front, the sides, but also the rear. It has explosive reactive armor, which could be added on and removed, which neutralizes incoming RPGs and anti-tank missiles when they hit. And unlike most tracked fighting vehicles, it has a slight given the shaped hull, which help deflect mine blasts when IEDs or mines are being rolled over. Despite though its massive weight of 60 to 65 tons, it maintains full protection across all angles, including, as I'd mentioned, the rear, but also the roof, making it one of the safest vehicles for urban combat, which is particularly where this vehicle shines. But thickness of armor truly isn't where this vehicle stands out. Its best advantage is the integration of the active protection system, the Trophy, from Raphael Advanced Defense Systems. It detects, tracks, and destroys incoming projectiles with great results, including RPGs and anti-tank missiles from top-down attack. This is a very prominent system. It pinpoints also the enemy's firing position. It can detect where it's been fired from, allowing the Crusade weapon inside of there to engage back, which it does have an RWS system to fire 12.7mm rounds right back at wherever that projectile came from. During Operation Protective Edge in 2014, Trophy intercepted multiple missile threats, proving its effectiveness on the battlefield, with battle-tested results being given back to Raphael Advanced Defense Systems to modify even further. The interior of the Namer is also built with safety in mind. It has non-flammable materials all over the vehicle, even their seats to the cushions, to prevent fire spread, shock-absorbing seats which are suspended from the floor to reduce the impact of mine blasts, which are quite common, and an air filtration and MBC system allowing the vehicle to operate in nuclear, biological, or chemical warfare environments, but more particularly, as you can see in this footage, dusty environments. It is very dusty in the environments that these vehicles work in, particularly when they're operating alongside the infantry and having to stir up all that muck. It's just not enjoyable to have to pull up, dismount your troops, get all that dust that they've just been delivered to inside the crew compartment. That filtration system is very important. It keeps comfort of the crew inside there really, really nice. Of course, the poor infantry that are dotting around outside just have to bear with it. It's part of the infantry world, I guess. But how does it stack up against the world's other top-tier armored personnel carriers? Compared to the Russian T-15 Armata, the Neymar does weigh more, but of course with that weight comes superior urban combat protection, which the T-15 really does not. Against the German Puma IFV, the Neymar trades speed for extreme survivability. Puma is fast, Neymar is not that fast. And unlike the American Bradley IFV, the Neymar is built primarily for protection rather than firepower as an IFV. But Israel has big plans for the Neymar, with a goal of fielding over 500 of these vehicles by 2027. The next steps for upgrades may include, and what have been considering to include, autonomous capabilities for future battlefield roles, where you basically don't need a crew of this vehicle, it will just deliver the infantry in a robot version, or can be controlled remotely. And speaking of remotely, that RWS system, which the commander can operate on top of the vehicle, is also looking to be upgraded with a potential 30mm variant, which in some terms is turning it into somewhat of an IFV at that point. A 30mm gun is a big cannon to put on top of there, and you are sacrificing a bit of weight and space inside of that vehicle for ammunition of a 30mm gun, but it'd be interesting to see how that's integrated. 
There is potential to export, and there's a lot of interest to export, though Israel has been very, very cautious about selling this platform abroad. Okay, so I think it's safe to say we've established that this platform is a rolling fortress with unparalleled protection, but all that armor comes at a cost with that weight. The 60-70 tons put a lot of strain on this vehicle's engine, but what does that mean? Does it mean it's slow and sluggish? Well, not exactly. Let's talk about the power behind this beast and how it moves across the battlefield. This particular variant is moving across the battlefield by deploying its own bridge because it's the engineering variant, but this time I want to talk about the actual engines. The original engine is the AVDS 1799AR, which is a 1200 horsepower V12 engine. That is a main battle tank engine in an APC, providing solid mobility, but it does strain a little under the vehicle's increasing weight and the more armor that you place upon there. There is a planned upgrade that was made in 2019 and Israel purchased the MTU MT883 V12 diesel engine rated at 1500 horsepower, aiming to improve acceleration, efficiency and off-road performance, and it does very well at that. This is a 50% horsepower increase to power to weight ratio with a significant upgrade ensuring that the Neymar remains mobile despite its heavy armor. Despite that weight though, it's not slowing. It's going pretty fast. A top speed of 60 kilometers an hour or 37 miles per hour is impressive, which is about the same as most main battle tanks and its advanced hydrodynamic suspension allows for very smooth movement over rough terrain despite its massive size, similar to the gun on the Makava tanks that can keep up with the stabilization of the gun in a really nice stable platform across country. It also enhances stability for firing on the move for its RWS or remote weapon system with that 12.7mm machine gun. One key advantage though is its mobility in urban environments. Unlike wheeled APCs, its tracks allow it to move effortlessly over obstacles, rubble and off-road conditions that would immobilize lighter vehicles or puncture their tires. Even with self-inflation, tires can only do so much with things like Molotov cocktails and such. With a fuel capacity of approximately 1400 liters, the Neymar has an operational range of around 500 kilometers or 310 miles, making it suitable for extended missions without immediate refueling. This endurance ensures Neymar can keep up with fast-moving armored battalions while still carrying an entire infantry squad into battle. It's basically turning itself into a tank infantry support vehicle, which is a unique setting. You would basically armor up this vehicle that could fight alongside tanks. Most IFVs tend to not do that. The tanks are the tip of the spear and the IFVs follow in behind. In this configuration, you have an APC that could go toe-to-toe -to -toe alongside Makava's in a tank engagement, but of course, most of these platforms in the Neymar configuration are not going to go up against tanks, they're going up against insurgency. Unlike most infantry fighting vehicles, it doesn't have that large caliber gun, and the remote weapon system still does very well for itself. It's based on a 50 caliber heavy machine gun operated from inside the vehicle, and it also has a 7.62mm MAG machine gun mounted for the commander. A 60mm mortar, primarily for close range suppression, can also be placed upon the vehicle. This setup was sufficient for defensive roles, but it certainly lacked the offensive punch when compared to some of the other modern IFVs. Recognizing the need for more firepower, in 2017 the IDF unveiled the Neymar IFV with a fully integrated unmanned turret armed with a 30mm orbital ATK Mark 44 Bushmaster autocannon capable of engaging enemy infantry, light vehicles and drones. It also installed the Spike LR2 anti-tank guided missile, giving it the ability to destroy main battle tanks and fortified enemy positions. Finally, a coaxial 7.62mm machine gun was also placed for additional firepower. The vehicle's reputation isn't just built on these specs that I'm telling you about, it's truly a vehicle forged in battle. The Neymar's combat debut came during Operation Protective Edge in 2014 where it proved to be an unbreakable fortress on the battlefield, taking multiple anti-tank missiles, mines, IED blasts, and kept on going. During this conflict, the IDF faced urban and subterranean warfare against Hamas in Gaza and the Neymar was deployed for troop transport through very dangerous areas without suffering any losses. Providing cover for infantry and operating as armored shelter, they were very renowned and respected by infantry on the ground. In one battle, IDF soldiers ordered an artillery strike on their own position, confident that the Neymar's armor would withstand the blast. 
From my research that I found, not a single Namor was destroyed in the 2014 war, a testament to its incredible durability. But its evolution didn't stop there. It's not just an APC, it's a platform that can be adapted for various roles, including combat engineering command, bridge laying like you're seeing right now, and medical evacuation. The Namer Combat Engineer Vehicle, or CV, which you're seeing is equipped with a bulldozer blade and breaching equipment used for clearing obstacles. Very, very useful in an urban environment. There is the Namer Combat variant, featuring an advanced battlefield management system and communication suite for leadership roles communicating between different APCs. And finally, the Medevac platform, which was even more heavily protected for the medical evacuation for three wounded personnel that can be placed into the back on full setup stretches. By 2027, Israel aims to have 500 plus of these vehicles in service, and they're looking to give more assistance to AI for battlefield coordination, more advanced armored personnel protection in terms of armor, and also the active protection system upgrades for the trophy. There is that potential for sales elsewhere, but I would safely say they are probably not going to export this platform. They've invested a lot of money into it, and as much as it would be good selling it, there's a lot of proprietary information or technology that I'm sure they do not want to push out to the world. So folks, what do you think of the Namer? I mean, it is an absolute beast in terms of protection. Certainly keeps up with mobility, with that powerful 1500 horsepower engine in there. I've never known of an infantry fight vehicle to have such an immense amount of power ready to go. And the protection that this thing has for its crew, I'd be pretty safe inside of there. So I do think though, Trying to turn this into multiple things could be some challenges. I mean, it does have an IFV compatibility, but keep it simple. I think that's what they've done. Really focus on that protection. But I know many of you are probably going to be challenging me all the time like you do about drones. And a drone can do this and a drone can do that. But if the APS is doing exactly what it's meant to do, drones are restrictively not going to be able to do much to this vehicle, depending on how many you have. But it's something I think is probably the only weakness for the Namer is drones. APS can only have so many projectiles protecting it from those inbound drone, I guess, attacks. You want something that can probably take on drones in a heavier duty capacity that can withstand maybe 10, 20, 30 drone attacks uh, because at the end of the day, a $100 drone can take out a sophisticated multi-million dollar vehicle and these vehicles are not cheap. If you enjoyed today's video, please leave me a like, click subscribe and I'll see you on the next one. All the best folks, bye-bye.